Hi, my name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here at Oswego Hills Vineyard and Winery. We're talking to Scott Burns today. Uh, it's July 31st, 2019. Thanks so much for joining us today, Scott. We appreciate this. And yeah, thank you very much. Uh, let's uh, start by asking uh, why geology and soil? What got you interested in that subject? Well, I just finished my 49th year of teaching uh, at the college level. So uh, uh, I, I go back to, I got a couple degrees, a uh, bachelor's degree, master's degree at Stanford, PhD at University of Colorado. But when I was at Stanford in California, I had a whole bunch of fraternity brothers that love wine. And so uh, once every six weeks, we would go up to this fledgling new area that uh, was developing called the Napa Valley. And we would go wine tasting, and you'd be able to do the whole thing from one end to the other in one day, starting out at Mondavi and Sebastiani at one end and finishing up at Charles Krug and Christian Brothers at the other end. And so my love for wine developed at that time. And then my first teaching job was in Switzerland. And in Switzerland, I uh, was in the heart of wine country. I taught there for five years. And I taught biology and geology in those days and chemistry. And so one of the best ways of teaching science to the students was making wine. Mm -hmm. And so we would go down into the vineyards and we would taste, uh, we would pick the grapes and they were all chasseless grapes, uh, which is a white wine. And we bring them up, we go through primary fermentation, secondary fermentation, we would do sugar levels, alcohol levels, etc. And with white wine at Christmas time, you could bottle them. They would be fine. And then we'd put them in the bottles. The students would design the labels, we'd cork it. Uh, and they would take a bottle of wine home to their parents and uh, tell them that, uh, that $3,000 in tuition that they were paying was very relevant uh, and that uh, higher education was great and they're learning some science in Burns's class. Uh, and so I, I, my, you know, as a professor, your very first uh, thing you're supposed to do is publish. My first paper I ever published was in the Journal of College Science Teaching in 1976 and it was Science Can Be Fun and Tasty, Wine Making in the Lab. <laughs> and so I made wine with my students and the bottom line was it was absolutely a so I was not good. I now leave uh, the winemaking up to guys like Jerry Marshall, who you're going to be interviewing in a second. Uh, but that got me going. And then teaching took me around the world. I taught in uh, Switzerland, New Zealand, Washington, Colorado, and Louisiana before coming back to uh, Oregon in 1990. I'm a sixth generation Oregonian. You guys are down in Linfield, okay? My family homesteaded there in 1844. My cousin still lives on the farm there, so my roots are down in McMinnville. And it was nice to come back here, but uh, one of my specialties in geology is the study of soils. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so I taught a soils class, and the, the second year I taught this soils class, and it was primarily graduate students. Every grad student had to do a project. A, a young lady in the class said, I want to uh, know what the soils are uh, that the, they're growing grapes on. Mm -hmm. And so the industry was just growing. This was 1992, and there were maybe 75 wineries in the state of Oregon at that time, and most in the Willamette Valley. Uh, and so she went out. Nobody knew their soil. Nobody knew what the soil was. Uh, and so so we started putting it together. The pro class project uh, was very interesting. It m morphed into a master's de degree uh, project. And this was Dion Star piece was her name, and she did a wonderful job. But then it became obvious at that time that there were two major soils. But if you if you were a winemaker and you sourced the grapes from the two different soils, and you had the same year and the same vineyard techniques, that the wines would come out different. And that's terroir tasting. And, and so we pursued this more and more through the 90s. And then we, uh, and we did a huge survey. We basically did half of the uh, wineries, vineyards, vineyards especially, in the Willamette Valley. And there were three major soil types that were out there. And we used the, the USDA, uh, Natural Resource Conservation uh, names. Mm -hmm. And it was the Jory, the Willikensee, and the Laurelwood. Jory being primarily developed on uh, uh, basalt bedrock like the Dundee Hills and that's 16 million year old basalt it's been weathered for a long time uh, and it is uh, um, very very red soil very very distinctive uh, but then out in Yamhill County many of them are on the Willikensee soils the uplifted marine sediments the uplifted sandstones and shales uh, and uh, they they were producing 
different wines. Same winemakers, same year, different wines. Now we've subdivided the Willikensee into six or seven other soils, but we still use the general term Willikensee. And then thirdly, in the late 90s, we realized that there was a third group, that number three uh, wine soil was the Laurelwood soil, which was primarily up on Chehala Mountain. Now it, it's, it's basically a bathtub ring all the way around the Tualatin Valley. And it is a basalt bedrock, but you have windblown silt, which we call lus, that is weathered into little piezolites, little tiny, tiny uh, BBs that are calcium, magnesium, iron uh, nodules, and it produces a completely different flavor. And so I started lecturing in the mid-90s on terroir of wine uh, in the uh, Willamette Valley and the three different parent materials producing three different types of pinots. Uh, and so since that time it has morphed into a study. We had a PhD student ask what are the differences that, uh, that are in each one of those uh, uh, soils and we'll get to that in just a second. So that's how I got into uh, uh, soils, geology, terroir uh, it, uh, as morphed through time. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the sort of reaction from the wine industry as you started getting into that and you were sort of telling them things they, 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 ha they weren't aware of already. Yeah, and it was really wonderful. One of my heroes was a guy named Ken Wright. Ken Wright is one of our great winemakers that we have in the state of Oregon. And he's the very first guy that all, all of his single vineyard wines, he put the soil on the back of the bottle. And because he knew, he knew uh, that the soils were important. Now, is it one of the most important factors in the second? I'll talk about terroir. Uh, but he said it is a key component in, in Oregon. And in fact, when he won Winemaker of the Year, from either the Wine Spectator or the Wine Advocate or whatever it was a couple mm -hmm. of years ago, he said to know Oregon terroir is to know, uh, or to know Oregon wi wines, you have to understand the geology that we have got. And it's important. Uh, so, uh, so what I'd love to do now is for a second just talk about terroir because this is a word that we use all the time. I've been using it uh, ever since the mid-90s and it's caught on in the state but the French have been using it since uh, for the last 400 years. And I lived in the French speaking part of, of Switzerland so je parle français un petit peu. Uh, and terroir is a, a, is a great word and terroir is the taste of the place. Now some people say uh, the sense of the place. It's a taste thing. It's it's what you are tasting. And so I use that all of the time. And uh, it, it was developed by the monks in Burgundy 400 years ago. And if you look at a bottle of wine from France, none of the, they'll never put the grape on it except in the Alsace area. If it's red and from Burgundy, you know it's Pinot Noir. If it's white and from Burgundy, you know it's Chardonnay. If it's red and from Beaujolais, you know it's a Gamay grape. If it's a red wine from uh, the Bordeaux area, you know it's going to be a blend. You're supposed to know all of those things. And and, and, and so uh, terroir is the taste of the place. A region is based on six different characteristics will have incredibly different things, that, factors that will lead to the flavors. And I'll get to that in a second. Um, for instance, if you give me a Sauvignon Blanc in the world, I can always pick out a Marlboro, New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc because it is so distinctive. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's all of the characteristics and that is terroir. Uh, if you're a sommelier, you've got to be into terroir because when you take a sip, you got to be able to say, is it a red or a white? Mm -hmm. uh, what type of grape is in it? Is it a blend or is it a single grape? Uh, what is the year? And then what is the region? Uh, all, as you get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger metals that you have got. Uh, and then all of our AVAs that we have are basically boundaries of terroir. Mm -hmm. Now, what is terroir? And I, I always love to define it because everybody has different uh, definitions, but it is important. And every time I give a talk on wine and soils and terroir, I define what I'm talking about. It's the taste of the place. Uh, for there, anytime you have a bottle of wine, it's going to be different from the next one, the next one, the next one, based on eight different factors. Six of them are terroir. Number one, the grape. And a Cabernet Sauvignon is going to be different from a Pinot Noir, different from a Chardonnay, etc. The grape type. Here in the Willamette Valley, we use 12 different clones of the Pinot Noir because Pinot Noir is the, the primo grape that is grown here. And you have the classic Pomard and Vadensville, but then you have all of the Dijon clones, the 776. 
7, uh, 114, 115, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, all the numbers that are out there. And each one of those will lead to different flavors that you have and different characteristics in the wine. So, but the, the, the grape is number one. Uh, number two, climate. Uh, is very, very important in, in the terroir. Uh, and, and, and so when do we in Oregon invite our friends to come to Oregon? It's always July, uh, August, and September. Why? It doesn't rain here. First of all, we have no humidity. Uh, and you want that temperature to go up in the daytime and down at night. Up and down, that leads to complexity. Uh, and, uh, and really, really good, well-balanced types of wines. Um, and then secondly, um, we don't have all the humidity and the temperature goes up and it goes like this instead of up and down and up and down. Uh, and, and also, we don't have to spray as much out here. We don't have to worry about that powdery mildew uh, as much as other places. I've talked to winemakers back in Virginia and Ohio and places like that. They they spray 18 to 25 times a year, whereas out here we're two, three, four times. Uh, and, and so that affects the, the grapes. If you look at all of the grape growing uh, areas of the world for Vitis vinifera, the French type of grapes, they're 30 to 45 degrees north latitude or four, 30 to 40 uh, degrees south latitude. That is overall macro climate that you have got. Uh, and then we have four different types of climate zones based on, I think, the world's greatest wine climatology. And that's Greg Jones, who runs your program. And you've got a cool climate, intermediate warm, warm and hot. Uh, and if you are going to grow grapes, you need to go in and ask, number one, what is the climate of the region? Because it's going to dictate what grapes you have. The Willamette Valley is a classic cool climate one. So all the Pinots, Pinot Noir, Pinot Gris, Pinot Blanc, uh, Chardonnay, uh, and the, the German style ones, uh, Rieslings, Gewürztraminer, Mueller, Turgo. Turgau. Those were the classic ones that you have got, defined on a, a cool climate. And cool climate is defined by average temperatures or growing degree days. Uh, intermediate warm, then you start getting into the heavy reds, the Tempranillos, uh, and into one of the varieties of the Syrahs, and then the Cabs Merlots and Syrahs uh, in that. Uh, 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 and you're getting uh, different whites. Viognier's are starting to be growing in that area. They won't grow in a cool climate. Uh, and then when you get into uh, and it's a, uh, Eastern Washington, Washington, Southern Oregon, Rioja, Spain are all examples, and, and Bordeaux are all examples of this intermediate type of warm. Uh, the Willamette Valley, all of Germany, uh, the Burgundy, we're the Burgundy of North America, uh, the Alsace area, the Loire Valley, all are cool climate types of ones. Uh, and then warm areas are going to be classic uh, Napa, Sonoma Valleys, a good portion of Spain and Italy. Uh, and then the hot areas, Lodi, California. Those old vine Zinfandels that you've got there. Uh, and then also uh, uh, Hunter Valley, Barossa Valley uh, down in Australia. And, and so the climate is a huge deal. Uh, regional climate, macro climate, uh, and things like that. Uh, uh, thirdly, the soils and the geology. What is underneath you? Uh, those nutrients, those elements are going to come up into the grapes. And there are 10 macronutrients, 6 micronutrients that are there that you've got to have. Three of them, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. They come from the atmosphere, carbon dioxide or water. But the rest of them are coming out of the soil. And you need to have certain elements, especially molybdenum and boron in the soils. Those are the two limiting ones, but all the other ones you need to have in there. And it's the arrangement of those uh, that will uh, affect the flavors in the wine. Uh, also, uh, aspect is very important. In the northern hemisphere, you want to have a south-facing slope to maximize heat units. And then elevation, you want to have those grapes ripen. Uh, and uh, you want to have that 23, 24 bricks, 23, 24 percent sugar at, uh, when, they, when they actually harvest, to have a well-balanced wine, 12 to 13 percent alcohol. Uh, and uh, if you are too high in elevation, you won't do that. I, a major change that I have seen just in my 29 years here, we used to say 800 feet elevation in the Willamette Valley was maximum height. Now we're up to 1,200 feet elevation and they're all ripening. Uh, all you got to do is ask any winemaker and they'll say the climate is warming and warming at a very, very fast rate. What we are now seeing is that at the lower elevations in all of the Willamette Valley uh, areas, they're planting Tempranillo and one of the uh, uh, types of Syrahs, which is uh, those first ones in the, the intermediate warm category that is there. And they're ripening.
Uh, and, and so, uh, and Greg Jones t tells us that the Napa Valley in a few years is not going to be able to grow anything except Zinfandel, which is at the very warm end because it's just getting way too hot. We are seeing, what, 30 wineries in, uh, in, in Great Britain. Uh, and Denmark's got 32. Sweden is, uh, all these northern places that got wineries, mostly white grapes. And in Germany, the, the, the red Pinot Noirs are growing all the way up to the north. And so the climate uh, uh, is affecting those things, but, the, uh, but then also the soils are very, very important. And, and I'll come back to the Willamette Valley uh, in just a few seconds. I've actually mentioned a little bit. So, uh, so aspect and elevation, very, very important that you have got. Um, and then also water holding capacity, because in the Willamette Valley here, we don't irrigate. We're dry land farming. And so at the end of the season, you got to have enough silt and clay in the soils holding water in there that the roots are going to uh, not get completely dehydrated. Uh, and, and so all of those factors, what they will do is they will affect the soil biota. So every two years we have the International Soil uh, uh, Terroir Conference. A couple of years ago we had it in McMinnville. Uh, and it was just absolutely wonderful. And the Italians and the French are really into the soil biota, the fungi, the mycorrhiza, the bacteria, etc. They are the ones that create the flavors. Uh, and, 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 and so all of, those, all of those first factors, the grape type, uh, the climate, uh, which is water and heat, uh, the, the soils, the geology, the aspect, uh, the water holding capacity, all of those will affect the, uh, the soil biota, which give the flavors. That is a summary of what terroir is. Uh, those little cre creatures in the soils creating these different flavors. And it is absolutely wonderful. Now, there are two other factors that are very important, but they're not terroir. They're the winery. And the number one thing is the winemaker. The winemaker has to do decisions. Do you use uh, do you use oak or not? If you use oak, do you use French oak, which is very nice and smooth, or do you use Hungarian oak, which is similar but a lot cheaper, or do you use American oak, which is very bold, you know, for your cabs and merlots, etc. Um, secondly, what type of yeast? Do you use the native yeast that are on the, the grapes, or do you inoculate to give the same flavor every year? Uh, do you do a secondary fermentation, malolactic fermentation, which, you know, California Chardonnay has that big buttery taste, and that's malolactic fermentation. How long do you leave the, the skins in contact with the juice before you uh, press them off uh, for the colors that you have got? All of these are decisions that the winemaker has to make, and they imprint that on their wines. Uh, and, and, and so th that is not terroir, that's the winemaker. And that's it. And then you also have vineyard management. Do your rows go north and south? Do they go east and west? What type of trellis do you use? Uh, and then what cover crop do you have? We have cover crop in between all of the rows here. That is a growing trend in Oregon. I say hallelujah because it creates healthy soils. Every time you plow, every time you cultivate, what you do is you destroy a lot of those mycorrhiza and all of the soil bacteria. Biodynamic wineries do not allow you to cultivate. Those are the ultimate organic wineries. They've known this for years. Uh, but it's the Oregon thing to go to less cultivations. Now, there's some guys that are a little slow, and it's every other row that they are cultivating, and then they're having the cover crop in. Because the cover crop is going to uh, compete with moisture f with the plant. But that's all part of the big picture. And since we don't irrigate, you know, the cover crop is there. So, uh, but all of those are vineyard managements. Those two will affect affect the flavors that you have gotten the wine, but that's the winery and not the terroir of the region. Uh, I believe that in the world, the best place in the world to taste differences in terroir is the Willamette Valley. And uh, it's best expressed in cool climate grapes. Two of them, uh, primarily, and one is uh, uh, Pinot Noir because it's a thin skin red grape. Once you get into the Cabs, Merlots, and Syrahs, the the thicker skins, the variety over a varietal overcomes, and it, you have to be a really good taster to taste the differences. But with a thin skin red grape, oh my God, the Pinots just the, it pops out. It, a beginning wine taster can pick those up. The other one is Riesling. The Germans have been telling us for years and years as you go up the Rhone or the Mosul and you will have two vineyards uh, 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 with same winemaker same year but different bedrocks 
The wines are completely different. And so those are two transparent grapes. Chardonnay is also a, a, a supposedly a transparent grape, but Californians, they over oak it to, to the nth degree, and the, 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 that's all winery that you've got there. But uh, I'm hoping now in Oregon, where we're going to back to the Burgundian style of Chardonnay, that we'll start doing di seeing differences in terroir with the different bedrocks that we have got. But why is Oregon, I think, the best place in the world to taste differences in the terroir. We've got the cool climate grapes, we've got Rieslings, we've got the Pinot Noirs, and in a short area, uh, a small area, you can source those grapes in. Now there are some uh, wineries that have all three of the major soils, and, and so they have no problems keeping all those factors that I talked about before, same, same uh, winemaker, same year, uh, same vineyard techniques and everything, uh, so the only difference is, is soil. That is terroir tasting. We also do a terroir tasting, and that is when we compare same vineyards but different years. Uh, and we do the verticals, and we do the 2015 do versus 2016 versus 2017. That's terroir tasting too. And that's done all over the world with the, the single vineyards. Uh, but here in Oregon, you, uh, what we're seeing is, you know, a small winery is on uh, the Jory soil, for instance. They will uh, create grapes with somebody on the Willikensee soils. Mm -hmm. They come in, so same winemaker, same year, just different soils. Uh, and then they can do terroir tasting. You're seeing more and more of that happening in the smaller wineries. Uh, and, and then the big wineries, uh, they are, uh, they're already, they're, they have their vineyards. Uh, Will Kenzie Winery, the very first winery in the United States to be named after its soil type. Bernard LeCroute, who uh, started it, was French. He's a terroirist. And he said, my soil is important. You buy a hat from there, it says, soil matters. I got three of those, <laughs> uh, and, 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 and so he had 85, 90 acres of Willa Kenzie soils. Mm -hmm. Uh, but then everybody said, how does this stack up to the Jory? Mm -hmm. And he said, well, I better get a, a vineyard. So he bought a, a vineyard up in the Dundee Hills. And so he had, you can go in and taste Jory versus Willa Kenzie. Same wine, made, all the factors are the same. People love that. And so we're starting to see those happening. We now have sub-AVAs here in the Willamette Valley. We were all the Willamette Valley AVA. Uh, but then the people in Dundee Hill said, you know, we have the Jory soil. Uh, we have the, uh, uh, the Willamette, uh, I mean the Columbia River basalts underneath there, and we want to put that on our bottles. And then the people over in Yamhill County said, no, we got the Willikensee soils and the marine sediments, we want to put that on it. And then uh, the people down in Eola Hills said, we have the Jory and the Kaya, which is a very shallow, um, uh, uh, shallow soil, so the roots get right through the soil and into the bedrock. Ken Wright says, I can always tell when the roots go into the bedrock because the complexity just explodes. Uh, and, and they also have the wind through the Banduzer Corridor. Eola Hills means windy. Uh, and, and so they have that cooling that occurs every afternoon. And they said, no, we want to put Aeola Hills on it. And then the people on Aeola Mountain said, we have primarily laurel wood soil, we want to put that on there. And then the people down in McMinnville said, we don't want to be left out, and so we want to do that. And, um, and so they developed uh, new ABAs, sub-ABAs, defining the geology, the soils, the climate of all of those areas. The neat thing, the neat thing is Oregon. In Oregon, everybody helps everybody. There's not this great competition. If your tractor breaks down, your, your, another winery will give you their tractor until yours is fixed. They handed in all of those applications for those sub AV days the same day. They said, we're not in competition. We love everybody else here. But that, all of those sub AV days are terroir. And now we have a whole bunch of new ones coming up. Now the laurel wood soil. Uh, in fact, it's going to be two sub-AVAs, one on Shayla Mountain and one out on the other side of um, uh, uh, Forest Grove. Mm -hmm. uh, so here you come to this valley, we've got transparent grapes, you've got great wineries and tasting rooms, and you have the three different soil types uh, to be tasted. That is the key. That's why I believe this is the one of the greatest places in the world to taste differences in terroir. Um, cool climate grapes and uh, the three major soil types that we have got. So um, very interesting 
interesting type of stuff. Now, back to the soils here in the, in the valley. I mentioned before, uh, we put together the story in the mid 90s about the Jory, the Willa Kenzie, and the Laurel Wood. And um, every winemaker and every taster has different uh, evaluations of those wines. So again, terroir tasting, you have same winemaker, same year, but different soils. And, but in general, it used to be in the early days when you poured a Jory versus a Willa Kenzie, I could always tell just by the color. Jory was always light red and Willa Kenzie was always darker. Mm -hmm. uh, but then Robert Parker developed this methodology of evaluating wines and one of his characteristics for red wines it has to be darker red, not light red. And what it does is it kills the Jory uh, uh, Pinot Noirs, and I've noticed that the, the, the Jory Pinot Noirs have gotten darker and darker because everybody on the back part of the property has a few rows of Marichal Foch or uh, uh, Syrah grape. You add that 5% in, you can legally do that, and it turns it darker. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but, so, but the flavors don't change. Uh, and, and, and so the, the, the Jory soils, the, the um, basalt soils, tend to be more red fruits, the red cherries, raw, strawberries, etc., versus dark fruits uh, of the marine sediments, which is uh, primarily dark cherries, dark currants, uh, blackberries, and things like that. Uh, and then the laurel wood is somewhere in between. But it has a, a kind of neat uh, additional flavor in there from these little piezolites that uh, are there. So soils are important. I'm a geologist. I'm a soil guy. A lot of the winery guys call me Dr. Dirt. Uh, but but is, is soil the most important? No. You know, as I mentioned before, big picture winemaker is the most important thing. But in those six factors that affect everything, it is a differentiating thing. And now it excites me to the nth degree that many of the people on the back part of the label, on their single vineyards, they will put in the, uh, the soil type. And a lot of people are putting in those clones. Mm -hmm. And some guys are actually doing clonal things. That is also terroir differences that they have. So on the front you have the year. Year is very important. Uh, and, uh, and I still remember, especially in the infancy of our wine industry, now it's mature. I mean, uh, but if I saw 1997, 2007, 2011, I'd say, oh my God, those are absolutely awful years because those were El Nino years, at least the 2007 uh, and 1997. This would be a wet year uh, and colder, colder, and you, uh, they were picking some of those up until Thanksgiving because you just couldn't get those 20. 324 bricks. Uh, 1997, the wines were just not very good. Mm -hmm. El Nino. And I still remember Lynn Panarash, famous winemaker here, was the head winemaker at uh, um, where? Rex Hill. Rex Hill. She was at Rex Hill. Had huge volume of Pinots. And the, uh, the owner said, you know, you've got to sell all of that. And so she did. She marketed it as Vino del Nino. Her son, first grader, uh, made a label, stick figures with colorful balloons, sold it for $6 a bottle, approximately something like that, sold out. And then the owner the next year said, yeah, I want you, that was a huge seller, uh, would love to have you do it again. She said, I just saved you the money. That was a mistake wine. Now, it's interesting. I gave a talk up at Whitman College to the geology students. And I go up there every couple of years. And I gave my terroir talk. And I tell you the story about that. A kid at the end raises his hand. And he says, I was the kid who did that label. <laughs> and he became a geology major. And, um, and, but he very, very famous. And, but in 2007, next El Nino year, 10 years later, I said, oh, my God, it's going to be another kiss of death year for the Pinots. Uh, white wines, can, you, you can recover on those. Uh, um, but they, they weren't too bad. Why? Because the winemakers knew how to deal with uh, lower sugar contents and, uh, and more moisture, etc. They weren't bad. Uh, and then 2011, it was not an El Nino year, but again, another one. And, every, and, and, and those 2007, 2011 years didn't sell a lot of those wines. So they were stuck in the cellars. But then what happened six to eight years later, they started tasting those things. Oh my God, they are so good. Very elegant, elegant, elegant wines. Uh, and we've learned. 
that now even when we have a bad climate year we we understand how to make the wines you make the wines but you sell them mm -hmm. and then down the road you have these unbelievably award-winning wines those 2011s are just uh, I mean they're <laughs> getting huge amounts of money because they couldn't sell initially but they matured in the bottle mm -hmm. so climate uh, I, I, that's a, one major maturation that I have seen mm -hmm. here uh, in, in the whole state is how to deal with those cool climate ones now southern Oregon uh, they don't have to worry about that. Their biggest problem is forest fires. Mm -hmm. And forest fires are a huge problem. Mm -hmm. I led a field trip just a couple days ago up into the Hood River Valley. And uh, Phelps Creek, the fires got within a mile, mm -hmm. ruined his whole crop. He went from 5,000 cases a year to 350 cases that year. And he did bottle some of his Pinot, and he called it calamity. And I bought some bottles because every time I do a tasting, it is definitely a smoke tainted. Uh, and uh, it, it, it's something that we, did, we can't get out. You can't get it off the grapes, you can't get it out of the juice, and it is, it is one of our biggest problems that we have in the state of Oregon. As the climate is warming, we are getting more and more forest fires. Southern Oregon already has 12,000 acres and the Mount Post 97 fire going in. It's early in the season. So uh, this is one of our biggest problems that we have. I'm very proud of Oregon because we are producing so many great wines around the world. I just finished a four-year term as president of the, one of the International Geology Societies. So I did 17 keynotes in 14 different countries in four years. And wherever I go, I always take wine. I always take Oregon Pinots. Uh, and in fact, everybody else on my cabinet would always bring their wines from all over the world and we would do lots of wine tastings. Got a lot of business done as a result of that. <laughs> But, uh, but everybody knows Oregon because of the wines. Uh, and, and that is exciting for the economy of the state. It's exciting. I love going out to wine country and visiting all of the wineries. Uh, and it's just, they're bubbling with people enjoying the wine. And uh, you go to social events. And wine is the major thing that is served. It used to be hard liquor. Now we live in Portland. Shoot, beer capital here. Uh, we still do that. The, uh, the, the IPAs are still absolutely wonderful but wine is making a hit here uh, and 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 so the Willamette Valley unbelievably great wine Southern Oregon I love it down there in Southern Oregon I mean their their signature grape now is Tempranillo the best Tempranillo in the in North America is coming out of there and and, and so their cabs were lows Viognier oh I love their Viognier from down there uh, and and so they are doing a great job down there and great winemakers uh, and uh, there's cool clients Illinois Val Valley is cool climate, but then you have intermediate warm down in the Umpqua and the Rogue. Uh, and then the Gorge. Whoa, we have unbelievably great uh, wineries up there. From uh, Hood River to the Dalles, from Underwood Mountain, which is across the, the gorge. That's cool, cool climate. Unbelievable uh, Pinot Noir Chardonnays, Pinot Gris, and Gruner Veltliner. Oh, I love it up there. Uh, all the way up to, they're growing Zinfandels in the Dalles. You, what you've got in 20 miles is Burgundy to Bordeaux in 20 miles. Uh, and so they can source those grapes. They can pick them in the morning and, and be fermenting that same day they don't have to wait a long period of time uh, and so they are producing some really 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 good wines uh, my wife doesn't like Pinot Noir she loves heavy reds so we go up to the up the gorge and she can get the heavy reds now the other thing is a lot of the wineries down here are sourcing grapes from southern Oregon or southeast Washington so now we can get those grapes and and so every taste can be uh, uh, met in, in the area and, and, and uh, another big change that is happening right now where a big shift that I've seen in the last three or four years is bubbly wine Everybody is producing the bubbly, and I love it, and it's great. We also have a huge amount of, 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 of rosé. I love that. It's a great summer wine. Why? Because we're doing the Signier approach to uh, uh, production of Pinot Noir. Uh, and, and so great diversity in the winery when you go out to taste, and, and that's fun to be able to do that. 
So uh, those are some big changes that I've seen in the industry. It's wonderful to be a part of it. Uh, and I, I love it when people call me up and say, hey, Scott, can you come out and take a look at my soils? And, and if I, I do that. Uh, if they want a real soil survey, we got Andy Gallagher, who's just unbelievable. And, and he does a wonderful job of, of digging the soil pits and, and telling, giving you a soil map. So those are some uh, ideas Excellent. that I have. Well, take me back a little bit and tell me why the Willamette Valley is such a, why it has the soils it does. What is it, what, why, why the Willamette Valley is such a sweet spot for those kinds of soil types? All right, the, uh, the reason uh, we have a sweet spot for those three major soil types is the geology around it. I forgot the fourth major soil, Missoula flood sediments, which is the very, very bottom of the valley. So I wrote a book called Cataclysms on the Columbia on that. Uh, it's great uh, for growing grass seed and hazelnuts or uh, filberts as we call them in Oregon and, and hops and everything else but it's way too nutrient rich to, to grow grapes. Mm -hmm. It's got too much calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium, and phosphorus. Uh, and, and so we try and uh, have most of the vineyards. 90% of the vineyards in the valley are above the uh, Missoula floods. Mm -hmm. Once you start hitting the red soils, as you go up the sides of the hills, you're uh, above the Missoula floods. When you have the tan soils, that's Missoula flood sediments that you've got down below. Uh, now, some people grow grapes on them. Are they bad? No, they're good, but not as great as the ones that are higher up. Uh, white wines, my favorite Pinot Gris three years ago was grown on the Missoula flood. So the white wines, they do okay down there. But the Pinot Noirs, where you really want these different flavors, you want to be on the older ones. Now, uh, going back in time, um, uh, so the basalt that we have, Columbia River basalt, uh, it's volcanic. But where was the volcano? 350 miles away. It was where Oregon, Washington, and Idaho come together. And there are big fissure eruptions, not big volcanoes, fissures. The magma would come out of a hot spot. That hot spot is now underneath uh, Yellowstone National Park. Uh, but uh, the magma would come out. It started 16 and a half million years ago, ended 6 million years ago, but 90% of it came out between 15 and 16 million years ago. The magma would come out. It would, a lot of it went up into southeastern Washington. Uh, just layer upon layer upon layer, gravity pulled it. A lot of it got into the ancestral Columbia River. Anse ancestral Columbia River is uh, uh, 28 million years old. It just pushed the water over to the side and just flowed all the way down to the coast. Every one of the headlands that we have along the Oregon coast, Cascade Head, Tillamook Head, Cape Lookout, um, all of those are basalt flows that traveled all the way across our state. Uh, it, it, a lot of it solidified in the gorge. Oregon side straight up and down. Why? Because they're basalt layers one on top of another. A lot of it got to the Dundee Hills, all Columbia River basalt that you've got on top of old marine sediments. Aola Hills, all Columbia River basalts on top of it. Uh, and so, uh, so that is one of the major grape producing soils, the jory which is developed on that. But then off of the coast we have a plate that is being generated. 200 miles off the coast we have a chain of volcanoes that is creating a plate called the Juan de Fuca plate that is moving four and a half centimeters in our direction. That's as fast as your fingernail grows. And it is uh, coming towards North America. It goes down underneath us here. Uh, and then and we're going in this direction. It's going like this. It goes down and melts, comes back to the surface as a chain of volcanoes from Mount Lassen in California all the way up to Mount Garibaldi in British Columbia. So we have a lot of volcanic eruptions. But it also uplifts all of those sediments that were along the coast. The old sandstones, which were formed by the old beaches. So beach sand becomes solidified into sandstone, uh, uplifted sandstone. Uh, the muds off of the coast, further off, those become shales. Those get uplifted. So all of the our coast range is uplifted ocean sediments you've got. So Yamhill County and over in McMinn Mill, that is all uplifted um, uh, marine sediments that you've got, these shales, these sandstones that you've got. And McMinnville has a lot of the, uh, uh, the actual basalt from underneath uh, that is sticking up through these sandstones and, uh, and shales. And so they have a, it's a jory soil that is developed on it, but it's 48 million dollar, uh, sorry, 48 million year old jory soil versus 16 million year old soil here in the Dundee Hills or like Leland uh, um, 
uh, vineyard, which is south of Oregon City. That's two million year old Jory soil. Those are on another volcanic uh, uh, vo volcano that is there, and those are the boring lavas. And so someday we got to do terroir differences between the McMinnville one, same winemaker, same year, but different pyramid materials, the 48 million year old uh, basalt and the 16 million year old basalt and the 2 million year old basalt. Uh, so so the, those are the two major soil types. And then um, uh, we, we've had huge floods, the Missoula floods. Uh, and then they, they've got the main Missoula floods 15 to 18,000 years ago, forming most of the soils that we have on the bottom of the Willamette, uh, Yamville uh, valleys and Tuolet valleys. Um, but uh, in the winter time we get the east winds. It blows that silt off of the floodplains after those floods up into the hills. Uh, the West Hills of Portland got 150 feet thick of this windblown silt that we call Loess, L-O-E-S-S. -S. But the, it's been doing that in the Tuolet Valley for the last 100,000 years. Uh, and, and so it's weathered. The silt is weathered into these little piezolites. Mm -hmm. uh, and they just give this ad additional flavor that the laurel wood soils has, have got. It's, it's still the old Columbia River basalt, the red soil underneath, but then you got these piezolites in the soils up above, which is a soil forming uh, phenomenon. Early geologists thought, oh, those are old stream deposits. No, nope, they didn't understand about soils. That is actually a soil forming process that they got. So we got this diversity because we are at the edge of the wand if you complete. Uh, and we uh, we had the we had this hot spot spilling all of that uh, basalt down in, uh, basalt magma into this area and solidifying here, uh, and then we had the Missoula floods that came down uh, at the end. So so that's why we have this great diversity here, and we got the perfect climate. We've got this cool climate that is slowly edging towards intermediate warm that is here. So take me back a little bit to your teaching career. Oh yeah. I'm just sort of curious before you back back to Oregon. Tell me about some of, some of your stops along the way and some of the kind of highlights of, of your various various uh, career stops. So I taught in uh, in Switzerland for five years. Great. I, I'm still in contact on Facebook with many of my students uh, from back in those days. American College of Switzerland, uh, and, it, and it got me going in the wines and wine business. And uh, also I met my wife. I mean we were a ski resort. I would teach all my classes in the morning and early afternoon and then put the skis on, go up the top of the mountain, ski in the bowl, and then take the blue trail down to my chalet. One day I was going down and I looked ahead and there was a cute blonde that was skiing 50 feet, falling 50 feet, falling 50 feet, falling. <laughs> And so I said, I will go and help her. And I would be like Jean-Claude Keeley and come up just in time and, and turn sideways and snow would go over and I would say, may I help you? Well, I miscalculated, caught an edge and ran into her and ran, ran over her. That's how we met. And so we've been, uh, next week, 45 years of marriage. Congratulations. So, so that was a significant thing that occurred uh, there in Switzerland. Uh, and I still love, it also got me involved in um, leading uh, tours. I was a tour guide all summer long at the Matterhorn and places in Switzerland and taking people on hikes and I still do that today. I do wine tours, I do trips up the gorge and Mount Rainier and Mount St. Helens and the coast uh, talking about not only wines but also geology. Um, and then I, I lived in uh, New Zealand for a couple of years uh, and it was, I taught at Lincoln University which is interesting because they had in those days uh, New Zealand all of the wine came in boxes nothing was in bottles and there was no enology and viticulture program. It was minor, beer was the champion. Now, they ha export over a billion dollars of Sauvignon Blanc every year. And the enology and viticulture program is at Lincoln University where I used to teach. There was nothing like that then. But now it is, and so every time I go back, I always give a talk on terroir when I'm there, uh, and it's fun. So, but then economically, the tax structure down there was a disaster. After two years, my savings account was gone, and it's hard to buy land when you didn't have any money. So I came back to North America. I taught at Western Washington one quarter, and that was 1981 uh, in the fall, and the state of Washington almost went bank bankrupt. They had five nuclear reactors uh, called the Whoops reactors out at Hanford. They all went bankrupt, and so all state budgets were cut. All new faculty members at the UW, uh, Washington State, and the regional universities all were fired. We They finished out the quarter and we were done. So I had to find another place, so I went back to University of Colorado, uh, where I um, 
uh, had got my PhD and I uh, taught there um, just for two semesters as a sabbatical leave replacement. And then it was a good year for jobs and so I went to Louisiana Tech. I taught there for eight years. No wine down there except muscadine. Uh, and so I, wine thing took a hiatus for a few years there. And, but I, I got into the whole area of engineering, geology, and landslides, and so one of I, my other hats that I wear is is uh, um, geological hazards, earthquake hazards, landslide hazards, radon hazards, and things like that. And so I am also a specialist in those particular areas there. Uh, and then uh, 1990, a job opened up at Portland State, and I was lucky enough to be hired at a higher elevation, um, you know, associate professor instead of assistant professor. And I came back here. I'm a sixth generation Oregonian. It was nice to come back. All the relatives were here. Uh, and I've enjoyed teaching at Portland State. Portland State's an absolutely wonderful university. Just great, great students. and Lots of students interested and uh, highly motivated. And it's just a great place to teach. And it's part of an urban area and close to all the wineries. <laughs> and, and so I started getting into the wines and the wine soils at that time. And so that was my history there. And so I've been there for 29 years. I retired four years ago. I'm failing at this retirement gig, just as <laughs> Jerry Marshall is here too. He retired as an airplane pilot, as you'll find out in a little while. Um, and, but he is now into uh, doing an absolutely wonderful winery that we have here. So tell me about, uh, do you remember why you decided all those years ago that making, having your class make wine would be the best way to kind of teach them about science? All right, because a major part of winemaking is chemistry. First of all, determining the sugar contents of the, the juice. So when do, you, when do you pick the grapes? When do you bring it in? Uh, and, then, and then secondly, as you're going through the fermentation, primary fermentation, secondary fermentation, you're looking at how much alcohol is in there. You're also looking at the chemistry uh, uh, of everything. So uh, I, taught, I, I made the wine in my chemistry class at that, at that time. I quit teaching chemistry after the first year, even though I had two degrees in chemistry at that time. Uh, and, and a PhD in, in uh, geology, and, and then it switched over to teaching primarily biology, so I made the wine in biology from then on. <laughs> uh, but it was a fun, everybody enjoyed it. It was interesting, the third year though, all the brew guy, uh, the, the beer guys said, hey, we, we need to go to a brewery, because I always took the, the students to a winery mm -hmm. uh, in the winter quarter to see how the professionals made it after they had made the, the wines that they took home to their parents. And so that was an annual event, but there, there were a lot of beer drinkers at our college and they so I started taking them to Boxer Brewery um, and uh, the problem is when you drink a lot of beer uh, you pee a lot and so <laughs> the bus rides back we had to do an awful lot of stops so we stopped doing that after a little while so, um, so uh, it, it's a great scientific uh, experiment to do, uh, and uh, you learn an awful lot to it. Uh, and, and every uh, winemaker has to know all of the basics, uh, uh, you know, when to pick, et cetera, and then uh, when to bottle and uh, those things. So you mentioned that you're failing at retirement. I know because I've been trying to track you down this summer and you've been jetting all around the place. So tell me about some of the things you're working on now in your quote unquote retirement. Well, I do a lot of these uh, tours around the world. So I work for the Smithsonian and, I, and, and, uh, and then also Stanford University uh, in their alumni study travel program. So this year I've taken uh, a terroir tour, two week terroir tour of Chile for Stanford University. 24 people they sampled 81 different wines from one end of the country to the other. A lot of Carmen Air, the lost grape that you have down there. I, I took uh, also a group of 24 down to uh, New Zealand where I used to live and so we did North Island, South Island, that was for uh, Smithsonian. We had 26 people in that group. Uh, and then just th last month, um, another trip for Stanford's uh, Canadian Rockies, Mountain Ecology, Geology, etc. of Banff, Jasper, uh, the Canadian Rockies and then the Rocky Mountaineer train that goes from Banff into uh, Vancouver. And then just recently I got back from uh, uh, Iceland. Every summer I go to Iceland with the Smithsonian. It's always in July. We had 10 days of absolutely beautiful weather there. No wine there, it's, but it, for geologists it's Mecca. The land of fire and ice and, and, and glaciers and waterfalls and everything like that. The Mid-Atlantic Ridge is splitting open uh, and so it is wonderful. So I do that. I do local wine tours here and then I give a lot of talks. Uh, and my talks are all on 
earthquakes or landslides or terroir or dynamic geological history of Oregon or the Missoula floods, etc. So that is filling up my time. And I'm also a grandpa. So I'll tell you a lot of trucks. <laughs> I have a three-year-old grandson and I'm going to be spending a couple weeks at the beach with him. We're going to be making forts in the driftwood on the beach. And, and then I have a granddaughter, but she's six months old. And so she isn't into trucks or anything, but uh, Desmond is. So it takes up a lot of time there too. You can work with her for the future. She'll be, That's ready, right. she'll be ready soon. That's right. But he is into digging soil pits. So, uh, so you know, I'm getting him going early on the soil and geology, geology game. Yeah. Yes, in fact, he, he, every time he finds a rock, he brings it to me. And so, <laughs> you know, Grampy, what is this? And so he's learning. That's excellent. excellent. Um, so with the Oregon wine industry, you talked about some of the changes you've seen. What are you seeing as you look ahead for the industry over the next 10 years? What are the challenges and obstacles that the changing climate might might bring about and what are you looking forward to from a more positive perspective? Well first of all I, I only see great things for the Oregon wine industry. The people are just incredible. I love the annual uh, wine symposium that we have in February uh, every year. It, it's a great way to see so many people and reunite and it's just a very very positive uh, thing. Uh, economically uh, you know things are going well and but you know we eventually it's going to hit a point where the number of wineries is kind of uh, level off a little bit. It's still going very, very fast. <laughs> Climate change is not a problem for us because uh, we are, we're starting out at the cool climate. Uh, as the climate warms, you just go to the new grapes, the Syrahs, the Tempranillos uh, that you have got. Uh, and, uh, and, and you can grow Pinots. Uh, well, California is growing Pinots in an intermediate warm type of climate down there. We say they are just a little fat. They say they, that ours are too skinny up here, so uh, I think ours are elegant. But, the, but you know, for us, there will always be a wine industry because we have, we have the Cabs, Merlots, and Syrahs, maybe even Zinfandels, um, you know, down the road as the climate warms up. Um, there are some parts of Oregon that are not going to be wine uh, growing areas, for instance, uh, too, uh, too high in elevation that you have got. Uh, we have a great forestry industry and we don't want to uh, mess with that, but the, there are still a lot of areas where grapes are grown. I see us trying additional grapes and the, the varietals and a lot of people are starting to do that and you are starting to see more white wines, red wines coming in with different grapes you've never ever heard of. Mm -hmm. And some of them are very good, some of them aren't. And so eh, they, they beaver them off and graft on a new type of varietal. So I think it's very, very positive for the wine industry that we have got here. Um, you start out with great people and then you have great soils and great climate. You can't go wrong. And so I think the, the future of wine in the Oregon area is incredible. And I have one other uh, terroir I want to mention. And that is one of our latest AVAs, and that's the, the rocks of Milton Freewater, which is right on the, the boundary between Oregon and Washington. It's the southern part of the, uh, the uh, Walla Walla Valley. And um, first of all, you got to go back to Bordeaux. Bordeaux, um, back in the 1700s, you had all these nouveau riche guys. And they wanted to start wineries, but the, the Rothschilds and all of those people were not selling land down in the Bordeaux area, and they had, there was no land down there. So they hired a lot of Dutch guys to come down and drain the wetlands and build levees out there and dikes. And so they took all these river bottom areas, which are primarily gravels and cobbles and sands, and they turned them into vineyards. Those are where the primo Cabs Merlots and Syrah, the Cabs and Merlots, the Cab Francs, etc., are being grown today. Uh, and and, and you don't have much soil, it is just mostly gravels and cobbles and sand. Well, Christophe Barone, uh, who owned he, eventually Cayuse Winery, was looking for land. He's French, okay, so he understands Bordeaux. And he was looking for wine areas up in the Walla Walla Valley. And they would say, oh, here's $20,000 acres here, 20, blah, blah, blah. And he, he was looking at all these pieces of property available. And, and then as they were going to the south end, across the Oregon border, across the bottom land, he says, what's this land here? There's, I see that there's a piece of property over here. And they said, oh, that's bottom land. You don't want that. That's, uh, nothing will grow there. And he said, well, let's just go look at it. And it was all gravels and cobbles. And he said, how much? Oh, $5,000 an acre or something like that. He said, I'll take it. And they said, you're crazy. You know, it doesn't have all the silt and everything like the Walla Walla silt loam. 
Uh, he did. Well, he hasn't really, his Shiraz were out of this world. He doesn't even have a tasting room. You have to buy everything uh, on a future. He has not had a score below a 94 in all these years uh, for his Shiraz. And in fact, that whole area now is all vineyards. He, he has, he's enlarged, everybody else has too. He advises them. He understood the soils. He understood you don't have to actually have a lot of silt and clay in there to grow great Syrahs. And so, um, so that's an interesting AVA. It's actually in Oregon. Um, and, and most of those uh, vineyards, I mean, last year in the Wine Spectator, the three highest rated Ori, uh, Ori, no, American wines were all from the Rocks of Milton Freewater, the 97s. So, you know, on a worldwide scale. So that's another interesting thing to go there, too. Absolutely. So you kind of, you talked about kind of coming in and kind of the forefront of ter ter sort of terroir education here in the area. Tell me what you've seen change in that in, in terms of soil terroir education and what you see for the future of that as well. Okay, so, uh, so two different things, um, uh, the changes that we have got here. First of all, in the Willamette Valley and every place else in Oregon, the vineyard managers and the winemakers pay attention to the soils. And generally when you put your vineyard in, you get somebody to come out and do a wine a wine map, uh, uh, sorry, a soil map mm -hmm. of the vineyard because you will pick in blocks. Uh, and, and, and so every time you change a varietal, or so especially in the Pinot Noirs, a, a different, um, you know, Dijon clone 114 versus 115, etc. And every time you change soils, your wine is going to be different. And so you pick it in those, uh, and then you may blend them later on, you may not, you may have them single vineyard varietals, etc. like that. So they're paying attention to that. Uh, and then, secondly, on the, on the single vineyards, they're putting on the back their soils. Thirdly, in the wine tasting rooms, everybody is being educated in the, that area. And you got to know those soil types that are there. And, and my aim, my goal in life is that every tasting room manager here and every person going into a tasting room in the state of Oregon are asked three questions. What's the year? Because the year is going to be important, even though the last four or five have been very, very good. Uh, number two, what's the clone of the Pinot Noirs that you've got? And number three, what's the soil type? Is it a Jory? Is it a Willa Is it a Laurelwood? Or the cousins that are associated with those? I mean, I still re there is a, gr a bunch of groupies that just love the Laurelwood soil. They just absolutely love it. And, and they just, they, they, the flavors that are there, that's terroir. Um, and, and so I'm seeing this happening. More and more people are putting the soils on it, uh, in addition to the, uh, the year, which is on the front, and the clones that are on there. That's terroir tasting. Uh, and that makes me really happy happy and because we are you know we just had the IPNC uh, here and then we had Pinot Camp back in June all these people coming from all over the world to taste our Pinots they got to know those basics uh, you got to know the geology you got to know the soils you got to know the clones and you got to know the year in order to taste our wines that we've got here so I think the, ro uh, the future for the whole industry is just absolutely wonderful great people great soils great grapes you're going to have a great future. One last question for you. Uh, as you look back over your career, what's uh, something you're, you're, you're proud of, proudest moment of your career? Well, uh, I've, had a, I've had a whole bunch of real positive things uh, in my career. Uh, academically, you know, I've, I've published a lot of uh, papers, books. The books have done well. Um, I have been national president of, of one of the geology organizations, international president of another one. Um, uh, I have, I'm becoming honorary member of, the, of one of the societies, which is the highest honor, only one person a year uh, next month. Um, so academically, that's great. Uh, I have got a great wife. I've got great three great kids. On Monday, I did a wine tasting tour for my family, mm. all my cousins and brothers, sisters, and everything, because they kept on saying, "Scott, you're doing all these wine tours for all of these Rotary groups and and alumni groups and the professional groups. We want to do one for us." And I sat there in the bus as we were going around, and I said, "You know, I have an absolutely great family." So. Uh, 
you know, my parents and my grandparents, uh, both sides did a great job of producing just great cousins and brothers and sisters like that. And then I got uh, two great, uh, wonderful uh, grandkids right now. So those are prides of my life. Great wife, great kids, great grandkids, wonderful. And those are the things. And then I sit back as a geologist now, and all the leaders in my field are all my students. And we're putting on the Highway Geology Symposium here. So this is engineering geologists who deal with highway geologists. All my students who are organizing it. Uh, and I just sit back and say, I'm the proud papa of all these guys. I had an influence on them. And, and so if I go to the conferences, I just say, that guy won an award. I, you know, I taught him. And, and so that's one of the things as an educator that you can do. And, and so it makes you really, really proud. And uh, the impact that we've had here, uh, soils are just a small part, but an important part here in Oregon. Uh, to, oh, and by the way, uh, the Jory soil is our state soil. And I got to tell you the story about that. And why do we have a state soil? Why do we have a state rock, a state tree, a state drink? Straight state drink should be either a Pinot Noir or an Oregon microbrew. It's milk. The Tillamook Milk Lobby got through and got that through the legislature. And all these have to be okayed by the legislature. But why do we have a state anything? Every kid in the United States in fourth grade gets a little blue book called the Oregon Blue Book, the Washington Blue Book, California Blue Book, telling you all your state things, why you are unique compared to the other states. Back in 1990, the uh, um, uh, Soil Science Society of America said, you know, we need to have a state soil for every one of the states. And uh, what we need to have, uh, and we had five of them at that time, right? Uh, so every Soil Science Society, and eventually I became president of the Oregon Soil Science Society, um, he had to choose uh, a, a soil. It had to have large acreage, so the Jory soil has its number four in acreage in the, uh, for, uh, uh, for agriculture, and it has to be distinctive. Well, it's the reddest soil in the state of Oregon. No brainer, and so we chose that. Uh, then you have to pass it through the legislature, and in Oregon, that's a kiss of death because you got to unite the east side with the west side. Well, it's a soil, and it's all on the west side. It's all it's all climate driven, where we have water, and it's all around the Willamette Valley, even though it's number four agricultural soil. And so how are you going to pass it through? Well, it's all on Columbia River basalt. Where did the Columbia River basalt come from? It came out of the ground in eastern Oregon where the three states come together and then came down and solidified in the west and it weathered here. And so when I finally got it through the legislature, I just and I said, this is one bill that's going to that's going to unite the east side with the west side. It was weathered on this side, but the actual basalt layers came from the east side. East plus west equals Jory soil. Vote for it and it passed. <laughs> but it passed in 2011. But in 2009, it was voted the dumbest bill in the legislature. I was on every talk show in Portland about my dumb bill. <laughs> Why are you putting this through? And I had to explain what I just did to you. It passed the next year and we just because we reunited it and and so it makes me happy so that's one of the things that I got to do I led the pack I wasn't the only guy that did that but I led the pack uh, to have a state soil and so every time we see Jory I mean we now have Jory restaurants and Jory condominiums and the name is out there everywhere and it, it all goes back because it's our state soil Thank you very much for the interview today. That's awesome. Thank you so much. We really appreciate this. this has been and thanks for all that you guys are doing at Linfield. I think that your program down there is absolutely wonderful. We think so too. So thank you so much. Great questions. Awesome. Well, go ahead and let you off the hook then. All right. Are you ready for Jerry? I think so.